the parks cultural resource staff do work with the archaeologists or the I'm sorry the um, tribes, and we do have a lot of ethnobotanical reports and research that they've done. Um, so we've got that partnership built, and we do a lot of consultation with the surrounding tribes. But we don't have, beyond just the Wallapai partnership that we have formalized with our program, um, we don't actually do a lot of work with traditional medicinal use of plants. Um, we did some research in that when we were working on um, some of the different outreach materials, but it's, it's not a huge component of what we do. Don, so did you think of our work? Death Valley recently, and I was at home that the CCC was planning cameras there back in the 30s. I was just wondering if they were planning cameras at the Grand Canyon. And the second, um, part, second part is that the cameras there were incredibly huge. I, mean, how, I didn't realize cameras could get that large. Um, it's possible that those were different species. There's also, a, um, it's called a phyla ethyl, that is more of an evergreen that grows, um, well, you've been to Phantom Ranch. There's one down at Phantom Ranch, that really large tree that's by the um, cantina. That's an ethyl. And they're the ones that were more planted like in farmsteads and near houses. They, they are a lot larger. So it could be that it was that. Um, I'm not aware of the CCC, and a history was recently done on the CCC. I don't believe that there was ever planting of Tanner's in Grand Canyon. But maybe the family ranch one. That, that probably was a horticultural planting, yeah. I mean, whether it was CCC or not, I don't know. I'm not sure how old that tree is, actually. Yes? Yeah, on invasive species, I was in uh, California last week, in the Sierra, Sierra and mustard was everywhere, and it's under some of the creosotes, it's totally taken over. And so I got two questions. One, why is there such a sudden explosion? Because a couple of years ago, it didn't seem to be there. And two, is there any discussion about a strategy for it? Because it has this deep taproot. It seems like kind of hopeless effort to get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories about the explosion. Um, and some of them were just the precipitation, the drought and then precipitation that kind of led up to that. Their seeds can actually last for, a, I want to say 12 or more years in the soil. So they kind of await just the ideal conditions. Um, so it has been in the country for quite a while, but it probably was one of those ideal conditions. And then the spread of it is because of those characteristics. I mean, each plant produces, I forget what the slide said, um, like 100,000 seeds, one plant can produce 100,000 seeds. So as they start tumbling and they're dropping seeds and they've got a sticky coating and they're sticking to things and they're being transported, I mean, that was part of the spread also. Um, but I do, I think it was just a kind of ideal situation as far as climate. The uh, Tar Week Valley uh, bird reseeding, was it successful? Oh my gosh, that's where I recognize you from. Yeah, it um, wasn't successful. You know, I mean, I'm gonna have to tell you the honest answer, and that is that I don't know. You don't know. I know that's not what you wanted to hear. Um, I haven't been out there. The last two years, we've had scheduled trips to go out there, and you know, it is a hard area to get to, and in the end, workload has kind of necessitated canceling them. And so since that time, I've never been back out there. Now, that's it. We have a crew that's going out there this year, and they're surveying the entire roadside, and they're looking at um, the, the um, rim area, and they're going to go back to that area, and they're going to retake the photographs. Like I, I don't know if you remember, but I installed photo points on the edge of the burned and um, seated area, so we'll retake at least the photo points. I've heard mixed things, like the ranger that was out there said that there was a lot of growth that next year, not sure what it was, and I think a lot of that was grown again. That was the guy with the extra movie. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Jim Wessel. Sort of next week. They were cartoons. Yeah. Is the mule concessionaire required to use weed free hay? The mule concessionaire actually currently uses weed, free, weed seed free hay, but. Um, we don't have that SOP in place yet, the standard operating procedure. 
So it's written and it will require them to use that. Um, we did run into an interesting situation, I think it was last year, where when we called and said, what are you using, where are you getting it from, they told us it was certified and this and that, and we actually kind of found out that it wasn't true, and so that accountability wasn't there. And the standard operating procedure that we just developed will put that layer of accountability and will actually do checks. But the in-park um, trail crew use it certified. The challenge up until now has just actually been purchasing certified weed seed free in Arizona. Um, but the park, all the concessionaires do use it. But it's not required that if you get a private stock use, there's, there's actually no requirement. People are just doing it. Right, now I'm just wondering, um, with the removal of, uh, of so many of the tamarisk trees, um, how, what is the impact on the wildlife that's come to you know, like rely on those trees? Well, um, the, when we do the removal, some of the trees are actually, all of the trees are left on site. And the idea then is that the native vegetation would come back. So, but there is going to be this gap in time. Um, between when the tamarisk are removed and there's native vegetation. So in some cases, and when you see kind of large-scale tamarisk removal projects, there is a very um, clear impact to wildlife. I mean, they're, they're used, I mean, there used to be, gosh, they're not good for anything. They use 200 gallons of water a day and nothing like some, and, and, and that's not true. There, there's a great diversity of insects that utilize tamarisk and also birds. So in the side canyon project, um, we've left the material on site, so it's not going to provide good cover or nesting material for very long, but at least it's still on site. And, um, and there is enough mature and structurally diverse native vegetation that the wildlife can use in those areas. Um, in the river corridor, we'd have to take a much more proactive approach if we were to tackle that in the future, or say if the tamarisk leaf feeding beetle makes it to the Grand Canyon, um, because that's obviously going to be a much more widespread impact. We'd actually have to actively restore native vegetation and probably work in kind of pockets. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, flycatchers, there's a host of neotropical birds that utilize it, plus insects, etc. But we, we did think about that during the side canyon project. Anyone else? Sorry I went so late. <laughs>